In the last lecture, we talked a lot about concepts from physical chemistry. Um, we talked about basic physical concepts, uh, things like um, how things propagate through the environment, um, how molecular communication compares with wireless. We talked quite a bit about uh, energy um, and we came up with some ways to think about how to create a molecular communication transmitter. Um, so in this lecture, what we're gonna talk about is um, some physical concepts that are very important as far as how uh, molecular communication is accomplished at the molecular level, and that is by chemical reactions. So in this lecture, we're gonna talk about chemical reactions. So the most important thing to think about, uh, or the most important thing to do first is to define what we mean by a chemical reaction. So a chemical reaction is a transformation from one chemical species To another. And depending on when you took your last chemistry course, which could have been some time ago, for me it was um, at least 20 years since I personally took my last formal chemistry course, uh, you probably remember uh, chemical equations. So often chemical reactions are represented in chemical equations. And you may remember what chemical equations, chemical equations look like, but just to get back in the swing of things, uh, let's see an example. So for example, combustion reaction. Let's say we have um, methane and we react it with uh, atmospheric oxygen. So this is, um, this is a, a straightforward reaction the product of any combustion reaction is carbon dioxide and water. And one thing that's important is to make sure chemical reactions uh, balance out. Again, you might remember this from the last time you took a formal chemistry course, um, but the idea is that the total number of atoms on one side must equal the total number of atoms on the other side. Um, so I won't go through exactly what is going on here. I'll only verify, but it turns out to make this balance one molecule of methane plus two molecules of oxygen will produce one molecule of carbon dioxide and two molecules of water. And it's pretty easy to see how this works. So, I mean, in a chemical reaction, it's important to note that atoms are neither created nor destroyed. Um, one carbon here, one carbon here, four hydrogens here. We have two times two, which is four hydrogens over here. We have um, a total of four oxygens right here. And on the right, we have two oxygens in here and two times one oxygen is another two over here. So it's four oxygen. So everything balances out. So uh, chemical reactions balance. One point to take away here. Another is that uh, species are transformed. So again, uh, by species, I mean, here we have methane, here we have oxygen, 
here we have car and that's transformed into carbon dioxide and water. Um, but it should be clear that atoms remain unchanged. If the atoms changed, then we would no longer be talking about a molecular, excuse me, a chemical reaction. We would be talking about a nuclear reaction, which is not something we're going to be talking about in this course. All right, so that's just, uh, we're not gonna actually see any, uh, in general, we're not gonna see any specific reactions like that. So in general, we will treat reactions contractly. What do I mean by that? So instead of uh, a second ago in the example, if I go back, we had molecules that we've heard of. So methane, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. Over here, we are not going to deal with chemicals or excuse me, molecules that have names or, or, or well-defined chemical formula. We're just gonna be dealing with them as symbols. So you can just think of them almost, almost algebraically. Uh, there are good reasons for that. One is uh, we're gonna be dealing with complex biomolecules that uh, are difficult to express in terms of chemical formulas or even impossible to express in terms of chemical formulas, but we still want ways in which to talk about the reactions. Another is that um, these reactions um, have basic forms that are very consistent across um, uh, across different kinds of molecules. They work in kind of the same way and we want to manipulate them in kind of the same way. Again, it's very similar to um, why we use algebra. All right, so to get the ball rolling here, let's talk about some basic kinds of reactions. Oops. Sorry for the screen jump there. And to sort of see this algebraically, um, we can imagine a kind of reaction using a molecule A plus a molecule B that form the compound AB. This we're going to call a synthesis reaction. Basically we take some, some, some A, some B and put them together. Um, going the other way, if we start with some compound AB and break it up into its component parts, that's called dissociation. We're going to see examples. Uh, we're actually going to deal a lot with synthesis and dissociation. So for example, Synthesis, that could be the binding of a signal molecule to a receptor. And dissoci oops, dissociation could be the processing of the signal molecule. Returning the receptor to its ready state. In other words, what we might think about is that this reaction, if you imagine the receptor looking like this, a signal molecule is coming along and might find its way into the receptor forming a compound. We're gonna call it compound AB. So this is, a, this is the signal molecule A, this is the receptor B, 
when they come together, we're gonna to call that AB. Then later, oops, um, while they are bound, uh, eventually, the um, so this the, the when they are bound together, then they have then they are the compound, and eventually this bound molecule is going to leave. Either it's going to be processed or it's going to be uh, somehow ejected. And then you will have back the unbound receptor and the signal molecule. Uh, and then the unbound receptor will be ready for another synthesis reaction. So there's two concepts that are important here. One is reaction rate. So if I have, let's say a synthesis reaction, I might write the rate on top of the arrow like so. And that basically, um, you can think of it, uh, depending on how the units work, you can think of this as the number of reactions per second. Um, it could also, uh, R can be dependent. Uh, so R can be the number of reactions per second and R can be dependent. Actually, let me go further. R is generally dependent. on the concentrations of the reactants here, A and B. Okay, uh, just a quick note about notation. If you see square brackets around a chemical species, that is the concentration of A. And we will generally uh, talk about concentration in terms of molar concentration. Now, again, uh, you might have to think way back to your last chemistry course about this, but molar concentration is not that uh, difficult a concept. Uh, excuse me, actually, this is something different. I'm gonna use molarity, by which we mean um, moles per liter. And remember that moles is, uh, it's just a counting unit. It's the number of multiples of Avogadro's constant. So in other words, if you have exactly Avogadro's, uh, Avog Avogadro's constant of A, then you have exactly one mole. If, the, if you have exactly one, if you have exactly one mole, of A dissolved in one liter of water, then the molarity of that is one. Okay. Second concept to note after that digression about notation is reversibility. And uh, this should have been clear from, um, uh, or actually this is implied by my definition of the two fundamental reactions that we're gonna talk about, synthesis and dissociation. But it is generally true that, all, that most of the reactions we talk about Are reversible. 
Not all, but in general, most of these reactions are reversible and there will be a forward rate. So many, there are many terms for the forward rate, but uh, often you will see something like K plus and then the reverse rate K minus. So in other words, what is happening is that A and B come together to form AB, but as you form AB, the, the compound AB, it can dissociate into A and B separately. So while these guys are forming, these guys are dissociating at the same time. Um, if you think about what that means a little bit more, what it actually means is that eventually these systems, these chemical systems will come to some sort of steady state where the forward rate and the reverse rate balance out and the system no longer changes. All right, so we've talked a lot about kinetics. Now it's time to actually analyze these systems mathematically. And the method by which chemical reactions are analyzed, uh, well, one of the principal ways is through a principle called mass action kinetics. So, under mass action kinetics, reaction rates are proportional to the concentrations. of the reactants so in a synthesis reaction if i have a certain rate a plus b to ab the rate of that forward reaction will be some constant i'm going to call it k plus again that's my forward reaction rate constant times the concentration of the two reactants. Again, um, I will write, so earlier in the last page, um, I wrote the actual reaction rate on top of that arrow. And then down here, I wrote something different. I wrote these Ks, which are actually the reaction rate constants. The correct idea, um, so I did that over here just for illustration, I did this for illustration, but this is actually correct. So what you'll see is that it's the reaction rate constant that ends up on top of the arrow. And what the reaction rate constant means is that it's the constant proportionality multiplied by these concentrations. Um, similarly, so that's for synthesis, similarly for dissociation. Um, and again, the, the symbol I used over here was K minus for the rate of that reaction, K minus times the concentration of the reactant over here, which is just AB. It's the concentration of that, um, of that compound. So um, you can now we are starting to form the basis of mathematical analysis of chemical reactions. And the most important thing that we're going to think about is how these um, reaction rates can be used to form differential equations. So if you imagine, um, so mass action kinetics, Can be used to form uh, differential equations. Uh, 
uh, representing the dynamics. Oops. The system. This will become important later, but for now, let's just let's just treat this um, very simply. So imagine we start with. Uh, actually, let, let me back up just for a sec. Um, consider a synthesis reaction. So in a synthesis reaction, what we would have is A, B, or a and B forming a compound AB with a um, positive, excuse me, a, 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 a rate coefficient of K plus. All right, so the if I look at the concentration of AB, time t and then I'm interested in the concentration of a b at some later time let's call it t plus delta t what's the difference there so what we could write is the change in that concentration you can probably see where this is going excuse me that should be a minus Sorry, let me just back up here. What will that change be? Well, we have these, these uh, individual components, A and B, and they are forming the compound AB. The rate of that reaction um, is given by R equals K plus times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. So we might expect that over a short period of time, if delta T is sufficiently small, this is the rate, in other words, the number of reactions per second, we would sort of expect that that would be K plus, concentration of A, concentration of B times DT. In fact, what we can do now is we can take the dt over here and we can say ab at t plus delta t minus ab at t divided by, sorry, I kind of gave the trick away there. That should be delta t divided by delta t is equal to k plus a b. And then as delta t goes to zero, um, well, as delta t becomes very, very small, we generally call that dt. Uh, in, the, in the numerator here, this is the change in a, b. So we, we would normally write this as d, a, b divided by dt is equal to k plus a, b. And you can do this for any chemical reaction you like. Um, the reaction rate, reaction rate, which is given by the concentrations of the uh, individual components and the rate constant is going to define the change in the concentration of the product. So generally speaking, you can look at chemical reaction such as this, and then write down its differential equation. That's gonna let us do a couple things here. Um, actually, let me just back up for one second. Now look, look at this equation. Um, if both A and B are changing at the same time, then this differential equation, so what's gonna end up happening is imagine, imagine also the reverse reaction, then we'll have um, uh, the change in concentration of A and the change in concentration of B 
as a function of the concentration of A, B. Now, we have a product of A, B here. So in that system of equations, this will end up being a nonlinear differential equation, which is not great. Let's first consider a simpler system. I'm just going to have, and this, this kind of system will actually uh, come up kind of a lot um, in, in very simple ways. So I'm going to have some compound A that can transform itself into B and come back. Um, remember, these are abstract. So this forward reaction could actually be dependent on something else. So in other words, I could add something here, but uh, it, it would be something at constant concentration. So I don't really have to worry about it. But just imagine that I have a very simple system um, of one chemical species transforming itself into another and coming back. And in fact, you could even think of this as a folding protein. So we could have a, a protein that is folded like this, that could be A and then the protein stretches itself out. We usually talk a little bit about what I mean by protein and folding, um, but you could just imagine this as two different states of one system. It doesn't even have to be a chemical system, it's just two different states of one system. Using what we just talked about, I can represent this system as a, um, uh, as, a, as a system of differential equations. So if I take A to produce B, I can write down this differential equation, DB by DT is equal to K plus times the concentration of A and DA by DT is K minus times the concentration of B. Okay, this all makes sense, remember? Uh, a produces B, so the amount of change I get in B is dependent on the forward rate, which is the concentration of A times K plus, and the reverse reaction, B turns into A, there's some uh, rate constant K minus, so the change in A is K minus times the concentration of B. So this is, this is quite consistent with what I just talked about. Um, if you look at this even closely, even more closely, this is a system of differential of two linear differential equations, and I can actually represent this as um, as a as a matrix, or in terms of a matrix. Um, now, here's how it's going to work. The change in B is going to be um, K plus, uh, excuse me, that, that, that K plus rate. So the, the amount of B that I get afterwards is the amount of B that you start with um, plus K plus times A. So you know, I, must, I must have to, uh, have to remove K plus uh, from A. And similarly, um, this amount of B transforms itself to A, so I must have to remove this amount of B from B. So I end up with a matrix equation that looks like this. Um, so D by DT of A and B is equal to some rate matrix. Now, what I just mentioned, that's gonna go into the rate matrix times the concentration of A and the concentration of B. So. It's pretty clear how these elements of the rate, uh, how, how these elements fit into the rate matrix. So let me write that. So R will be equal to, all right. Now, if I, I'm just gonna draw, I'm just gonna sketch this over here just to keep myself in mind of where I'm going with this. So D by DT of A and B is the rate matrix times A and B. Um, so what I, what I start with for, um, uh, excuse me, what I end up with for B is K plus times A. So ending up in B, 
I have K plus, and if you imagine, so I, I have this row of the rate matrix multiplied by this column. So I have K plus times A. And similarly, um, to get this, the change in A is K minus times B. In order to get that, I need K minus here. And then if I multiply this row of R by here, I get K minus times B over here. Um, one feature of these uh, rate matrices is that these diagonal elements have to make the columns sum to zero. And that's what I mentioned a second ago. So the amount of A that escapes from A is equal to the amount that reacts into B. So that means that the amount that reacts into B is K plus times A. So that, that amount must leave must leave A. So the amount of A that leaves A is K minus because it becomes B. And similarly, this column also has to sum to one for the same reasons, so that's minus K minus. And the reason is, let me multiply this by here, K minus times B, that's the amount of B that becomes A right there. So we end up with, we end up with a differential equation d by dt, concentration of A, concentration of B is equal to my rate matrix. I'm just gonna flip back to make sure I'm getting this right. So this is called the master equation for the system. We're going to come back to master equations um, later. But one interesting feature of the master equation is the following. If I come back here, if you think of these as two states of a discrete time system, or even a continuous time or discrete time system, but two states of a finite state, uh, a finite state system. The rate at which you go from here to here, if you have only a single molecule A, the rate at which you go from here is transition from this state to this state. And similarly, the rate from, from here to here is the rate at which you transition from this state to this state in the finite state machine. This actually becomes, uh, as we will see later, this actually becomes a Markov process. So you can make a transition from here to here at a certain rate or a certain probability in discrete time and from here to here. And what we're going to see is that this rate matrix and the master equation give you exactly um, the transition probability matrix for the, um, for the, um, for the discrete time Markov chain. So this will lead to this, again, we're going through some fairly intense theory right now. The important thing to remember here is, um, is that this will, this will all become very relevant later. But the important thing to remember here is that you can form this master equation simply from this, um, this reaction by forming these reaction rates. And what you end up with is a system of differential of linear differential equations with these rates. You plug in the rates where they go and just make sure the columns sum to zero. And then um, you have the master equation. Eventually, like I said, this will become, this rate matrix will become um, important in terms of the Markov analysis of these systems. In the next lecture, we're gonna look at um, the uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the master equation and how they how they relate to the steady state solution among other things.